Let me say how much of a pleasure it is to uh, welcome today um, to our concluding lecture series, uh, or concluding lecture in our lecture series, in our distinguished keynote series, uh, Professor Dr. Elizabeth Altman uh, from the Manning School of Business at the University of Massachusetts in Lowell, uh, Lowell, USA. And uh, we are very, um, it's a big pleasure to having you. Um, it's especially a pleasure to having Elizabeth uh, Altman as our final uh, speaker because uh, she's been becoming known increasingly for her great work and uh, extraordinary work on digital platform ecosystem. Uh, she has uh, served as a visiting scholar at the Harvard Business School and a visiting professor at the uh, United States Military Academy at West Point. Um, and uh, apart from all her work, uh, which by the way has also been published in some of the very interesting and very important practitioner outlets, uh, Harvard Business Review and MIT Sloan, et cetera. Um, what I find especially interesting is that she looks at uh, the issues of digital platform ecosystems from a long-term perspective as a senior executive. And uh, just recently, some months ago, I think, uh, Elizabeth, um, you published a very interesting uh, conceptual and review uh, a paper in the Academy of Management Annals on the translucent hand of managed ecosystems uh, and the idea of engaging communities for value creation and capture in those ecosystems together with Frank Nagel and Mike Tushman. Uh, and so it's a great pleasure uh, for us that you uh, join us um, and uh, to, to talk about this research project and your ideas and concepts. Um, before I hand over to you, Elizabeth, some very quick notes on technicalities. So as always, uh, Elizabeth will speak about 45 to, to 50 minutes or so, um, and uh, we will record that uh, um, presentation. Uh, you can always, you're invited to, uh, during the talk, uh, share questions via the chat. Uh, although we will basically, uh, Elizabeth will first uh, have her presentation, then we will uh, go into a Q&A, which is not going to be recorded uh, of about half an hour or so. And uh, that is uh, about it. Is there anything, young that I forgot to say? But I think more or less that's, uh, that's what we have to say for technicalities. No, that was uh, perfect. And we're welcoming uh, questions in the, in the Q&A and the chat. Um, during the talk and especially after the talk when we have the discussion. All right, Elizabeth, thank you so much for, for joining uh, us and for sharing your ideas with us. We are very much looking forward. The stage Great. is yours. Thank you so much. So let me share my screen. Just uh, Maybe before I do, let me just thank you all and thank everyone who has joined us. It is really an honor, a pleasure to be here. I'm um, thrilled to be here, actually. So again, thank you. And let me just uh, share my screen, make sure you all can see it. So are you able to see that? OK, great. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to be the final speaker in this extraordinary series that you pulled together. I teach capstone classes in our MBA and undergraduate strategy programs. So I aim to pull together topics from various other classes. And so today, though I'm not really going to pull, provide a true capstone, I do think the topics I'm presenting lend themselves well to being this final presentation. So I'm excited about that. Um, so without further ado, let me go forward here. Uh, and as I thought about my presentation for today, I decided I wanted to take both a more academic research approach and also share recent work that is more applied. So, uh, Andy mentioned our recent Academy of Management Annals paper, and I'm going to provide a quick overview of that paper. Um, maybe not that quick, but I'd like to walk through what that paper is uh, and kind of what we, what we wanted to show in it. That paper is actually the culmination of about five years, at least, I think, of research. It's an outgrowth of a book chapter that some of you might have seen called Innovating Without Information Constraints that we published, I believe it was out in 2015. And so I'll walk through the basics of what we did and what we found. 
And the paper is also already available, even though it's not fully copy edited, I don't think, but they put it out on the AOM Annals website as an in-press paper. So you can see the details there. And if anybody wants to, you can always ask, uh, send me a note and I'll send you the link. And then second, I'll explain new work that I've been doing as part of my role as guest editor for the future of the workforce at MIT Sloan Management Review. And that is in conjunction with Deloitte, uh, Deloitte's consulting arm. And this work builds on the annals paper in that we apply the concepts of ecosystems and particularly managed ecosystems to challenges related to workforce management. So for me, it brings together research on platforms and ecosystems also with some of the teaching I did in human relations management while I was at West Point, and it integrates work on platforms, ecosystems, and innovation, all of which I'll explain as we go through. And so finally, I look forward to a very interactive discussion in Q&A, and, &A. and uh, as Andy mentioned, we are not going to take questions as we go per se, but if people have questions that need clarification or something something isn't clear, please put it in the chat and I'd be happy to take those types of questions during the talk, especially if it's gonna get in the way of us um, continuing. Um, so without further ado, let's keep going. So one of the hallmarks of all of this work is it brings together distinct research streams. So first we have ecosystems. I thought about I should maybe put first platforms for this group since it's uh, our series is called platforms, but I decided that I would uh, keep it in the flow of the way the paper works, which is um, first we have ecosystems. And this is a photograph of a retail solar um, house, or I think it's retail. In any, in any case, um, Doug, Hannah, and Kathy Eisenhardt have a great paper about ecosystems. And the characteristic here is it's, it, the ecosystems don't necessarily have a central organizing uh, firm. Um, so ecosystems largely. Platform second, right? So here I just picked two that are transaction platforms, Uber and Airbnb. And one of the reasons, by the way, I picked those two is that we are not focused on technology platforms and product platforms per se, or software platforms, though those are always part of the discussion. So somehow when we get into these conversations, we always end up in definitional discussions, and I'm happy to talk about them. But Basically, I think about platforms as multi-sided platforms, transaction platforms, matchmakers like an Uber and Airbnb. And third, this work relates to open user distributed innovation, um, which encompasses the study of organizations looking outside boundaries to search for solutions uh, and engage communities of contributors. So Frank Nagel, uh, again, as, who was mentioned earlier is my co-author. He's an expert in this area. Uh, his work is very good, and I highly recommend that you take a look at it. And Michael Tushman, obviously, to any, <clears throat> excuse me, anyone who's familiar with organizational theory is kind of a giant in our field. He was my dissertation advisor, and Frank, Michael, and I have worked together. Um, and but what's nice here is Frank uh, brought his deep expertise on the open user distributed innovation. I brought platforms, ecosystems, Mike, you know, overall, and together we were able to put together this paper. Uh, so um, the other thing that, uh, another piece that we realized that is important in this work, and again, Andy and I uh, exchanged notes about this the other day, is that, uh, and I'm, let me just click through these, often um, the research that we see considers companies that are founded with these governance structures. However, in fact, many organizations, I would argue maybe most organizations, um, many organizations at least, are transitioning to them, right? And so uh, there's a 2017 paper that I wrote, article I wrote with Andre Haju that's in Harvard Business Review titled, Finding the Platform in Your Product, which is about this transition. And in that case, uh, we took a particular angle and then in this annals piece, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, we looked more from a theoretical perspective at the organizational adaptation and the challenges associated with these transitions. Um, and finally, we also recognize that it's an oversimplification to think about these transitions as switching, um, flipping a switch or just binary, right? Generally speaking, these organizations, so, um, uh, Lego is here as an example. I've done a little bit of consulting work with Lego. 
you know, they have done some very interesting work with um, communities and um, getting ideas from users. But of course, they still retain their fundamental product business. So then you end up with the challenges and tensions of managing both a traditional, more hierarchical product organization, much more internally focused, and also an externally focused community engaging organization. And that is not trivial, particularly from just a nuts and bolts management perspective. Um, and so we, so we have Mike Tushman as one of our co-authors and he obviously brought ambidexterity and did a lot of work um, on ambidexterity and innovation, explore and exploit, if you're familiar with that work. And one of the things we've done in this paper is try to bring the notion of ambidexterity into the digital age a little more and think about ambidexterity in terms of managing both an ecosystem platform type of a business and also a traditional business. So I will come back to that. Okay, any clarification questions or anything? Good, all right, I'm gonna keep rolling then. So this is what we did for this paper. The review, I'll click through them relatively quickly. Um, we put together a comprehensive in-depth review, primarily, so for anyone who's familiar with Academy of Management Annals, the papers are um, known as literature reviews, sometimes they're known as literature reviews with an attitude or literature reviews with a perspective. Um, and the point is it's a literature review, but you have to provide contributions. Okay, you did the literature review and generally, by the way, it has to be a synthesis or an integration of um, distinct but related literatures. And then what are your new insights from that? So we, our primary literatures were ecosystems, platforms, open user distributed innovation. We then, as I said, recognized the uh, interesting concepts around organizational adaptation and ambidexterity. So did two condensed reviews there. We looked at journals of management or theory, strategy, and innovation. We also realized that to be comprehensive, we really needed to look at information systems journals and practitioner focused journals. One interesting point is that these topics, and you all may recognize this, often appear in HBR, SMR, CMR, more practitioner focused, and often those journals lead um, on concepts related to these topics, more so than maybe some other strategy and org concepts. Um, we did wide net and narrow net searches that I'll talk a little about. Uh, an important point is that we did an iterative and inductive process. So essentially, I'm a qualitative researcher, and we used essentially a grounded theory approach to this work, by, but our data was the articles. And then going through and reading and coding the articles, we came up with our new concepts. And we'll, we present a concept, a construct that we call managed ecosystems. And we also then use a capabilities lens to talk more about them. So here is the figure. We tried to explain this a few times and we realized that we really needed a figure. And so here's the figure that just in one picture shows the whole paper. So ecosystems, platforms, open user distributed innovation um, at the top were our primary literature reviews. We also did literature reviews and talked about governance structures such as uh, transaction cost economics and the knowledge based view of the firm. And I will tell you in previous versions of this paper, TC and KBV played an even bigger role because we think it was important to understand those concepts um, and then that we're taking them a little bit further and I'll, I'll show you a, a diagram that uh, explains what I mean. And so we added a little bit of that in here. Then again, we did adaptation and ambidexterity and you'll see we came up with this notion of managed ecosystems and the translucent hand. And I'll, so I'll explain the translucent hand here and then probably a little bit later also. Translucent hand, um, you may imagine, so there's the, visible, the invisible hand uh, of the market, Adam Smith. It was very fun doing a 17, including a 1700 citation in the paper. Um, so we have Adam Smith of, with the invisible hand, and then we have Chandler with the visible hand. And again, we feel like most research picks a point of view. It's either open market or it's closed and hierarchical. And we came to realize that really that's not the case, that there's something in between, which is 
what we call a translucent hand, which is somewhat open, right? Definitely open in terms of communities, but yet has the locus of control still internal. And that gives it um, the translucency. So, and I'll show you again uh, a figure and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then again, because this is an annals paper and the way we built it, we, that leads then to our new insights. And we chose the lens of capabilities as a way to explain these. So here's um, a table with the journals and I just included it here to show you. And I think it aligns again well with what you all are doing at Passau where it's very interdisciplinary. Uh, we didn't set out that way. Um, and we actually ended up having to cut a bunch, but you'll see like the Yale Law Journal, for example, or the, their economics journals, um, management journals, there's a history journal, and then practitioner journals. And frankly, we could have gone even further, but uh, in our initial review, we ended up with 1600 papers, which we decided was enough. Um, and th this is the second table in the paper. This shows the keywords that we used for searching, uh, we separated out practitioner focused journals. We ended up with a lot of false positives because the word platform can be used for, so people talk about a simulation platform and then it shows up in, in your search. So we had to eliminate a lot of false positives. We ended up ranking and reading uh, the abstracts and skimming through about 220 papers. And then we did additional narrow net searches. And again, it's all outlined in the paper. This figure um, is one of my favorites and I think encapsulates the paper in kind of one shot. And that is that the locus of activity in, in ecosystems and platforms and open user distributed innovation, the locus of activity goes outside, right? So you get contributors out in the world who are helping. And then in traditional open market, you would also have the locus of control be outside. And so up here is where most of the community, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but ecosystem work is, is in this top corner, top right. And then of course, internal, internal is traditional. And again, we realized that managed ecosystems, the locus of activity is external, yet there's still significant governance. And I guess for a moment, I'll just use Lego again. This became very clear to me when I was working with them. On one hand, they're bringing in a lot of um, ideas from the outside. On the other hand, they have a brand to protect and they need to be very careful. I mean, you'll notice that although there's the Lego ideas platform, you'll never see inappropriate sets, right? You won't see sets about a terrorist cell or something that, you know, just can't be a Lego product, right? And that's because they are exerting control. On one hand, it's open and they're grabbing innovation. On the other hand, there's a very significant curating process that is going on. And so to me, that's a perfect example of a managed ecosystem. And then by the way, up here, we put heavy regulation because this has the locus of activity internal and yet the locus of control is quite external. And we think there's not, we are not as familiar with that, but, but we see that as kind of the fourth area. Okay. so. Um, most of this I think I've already covered, but I'll flip through it. We present findings that span the literatures. We found three commonalities, two topics that were missing or rarely addressed. And so again, the commonalities are locus of control, uh, sorry, locus of activity. There's always a discussion in these papers of the locus activity being external. There's um, overriding discussion of locus of control being within. And so this notion of governance and curation. And we see that across these papers, there's good discussions about capabilities. However, less addressed are these incumbent transitions and again, multiple governance structures. That's the adaptation and ambidexterity. So we derived and defined, um, we came up with this definition that I'll let you read. Um, we talked again about governance structures. We built on TCE and KBV and we said, um, that there are varying translucency degrees. And frankly, I would love to go much more into this discussion or into a um, study of how those translucency vary and why and what are the mechanisms and, and under what cases. Of course, we couldn't do it in this paper. There are probably six papers in this paper. Um, but I think uh, you know one of the questions that you all asked me was kind of where is research going? And I, I certainly would like to see work 
on building from this on a spectrum from closeness to more openness. And I think I have a bunch of ideas of how we could do that. And then um, again, so, so that's that. And then boundary conditions, because the, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion of, well, isn't everything a managed ecosystem? It's like, no, everything isn't a managed ecosystem. We went through um, a lot of boundary conditions um, in the paper. And we did notice that there are ecosystems in some cases that may or may not be managed. So for example, um, open source software, there are examples, and this is again, Frank's domain, but there are examples where it is um, very open and there is not a central organizing firm, but then there are other cases like Linux where there is a central organization. And though there are lots of contributions, of course, and it is, um, built on the notion of external contributions, there is still a central organizing uh, firm or organization in that case. So we highlighted four capabilities. Um, the first is shepherding communities without exploiting them. I will tell you in an earlier paper that, were, that was two. If you see any early drafts that are floating around, there was shepherding communities and leveraging without exploiting them. We put it together because we realized it was both in the same vein. I will give you um, a little anecdote on this. We went back and forth, um, Frank and I in particular spent a lot of time and then also with Mike discussing what the right wording was. A lot of people are using the word orchestrating. I've even recently titled a book chapter, Orchestrating Workforce Ecosystems. But um, we decided shepherding was better because in an orchestra, musicians, it's, pre it's quite prescribed what musicians need to do. Now, I think I'm, I'm not a um, classical music musician, and I'm sure I could probably get into a debate actually with Mary Tripsis, as you mentioned, my co-author who is, does play in an orchestra. Uh, we could probably get into this discussion, but in general, we feel like musicians are, are told what they need to play, and then the conductor conducts. Whereas sheeps, sheep uh, uh, grazing can go anywhere they want, in the grazing land and the shepherd just creates boundaries. So one of our viewers at one point said to us, are you saying, it was actually fortunately a friendly reviewer, sent a note and said, are you saying that sheep have more agency than classical musicians? And I said, I don't think I'd like to necessarily write it that way, but essentially, yes, that is what we are saying. We think the sheep do have more agency. And so therefore we think shepherding just invokes a lighter touch and a lighter hand than orchestration does. And so we chose shepherding. I don't know if it's going to stick, but that was the uh, little behind the scenes logic. The, the uh, conductor is also the interesting thing. Who, which, who is the dog, the shepherd dog in the orchestra? Yeah, right, exactly. I don't know. Um, and we'll leave that, maybe that's another paper. So, uh, Okay, so then the second one, maybe slightly less controversial, was managing data and intellectual property. Um, actually, Hemant and I are co-authors on a paper with a number of other people about platform data strategy. And we recognize that um, data is essential to most of these business models. And a more and these this governance structure, managed ecosystems require a much more open and expansive approach to sharing IP. And we think that needs to be discussed uh, in more detail. And, and again, spans the literatures. Ecosystem-driven open adaptation. We went around around about the term. This is now a little bit uh, of a mouthful, but we the point is that it's adaptation of organizations to a more open state because they're becoming more ecosystem-centric, right? And that's... Um, the idea there. And then finally, ambidextrous governance is the ability of an organization to successfully manage the tensions associated with both, with embracing more than one governance structure at the same time. And again, the notion of ambidexterity within organizations is not new. It's usually applied to innovation around explore, exploration, exploitation. We have not seen it applied in this manner before but we think a lot of the same difficulties, challenges, opportunities of managing in an ambidextrous mode arise 
when you're dealing with multiple governance structures. So I'm looking forward to having a discussion around those. Uh, and then finally, we have um, some future areas of research. One, as I mentioned, translucent, translucency levels. Also, um, oh, there's a bad typo, sorry about that. Variable approaches, differing starting points in the nature of the organization, stakeholder management, employee groups, unions, boards, et cetera. Again, adaptation. So even firms founded as managed ecosystems um, go through adaptation. We were talking about incumbent mature firms, but uh, if you look at say Uber needing to adapt as, it, as regulations change, there's a whole discussion to be had about that. Different ways to manage several governance structures, chains of managed ecosystems and nesting, we see especially in the travel industry, for example, um, TripAdvisor is an example where you end up with hotels.com and others inside them. I'm sure there are other international examples. And again, so workforce ecosystems as managed ecosystems um, is another topic and I'm going to move there now. So that's kind of the end of the discussion on annals. I think we're at 10.30 my time and I guess 4.30 probably your time. Um, and so let me spend a little bit of time now 15, 20 minutes talking about this new research. Um, and so please, if you have questions, I'd love to come back to talk about the Annals article, but let's, I'll move to this. So um, similar to how I got in touch with you all, I received a, a note from Sloan Management Review, I think in around maybe March of uh, 2020 saying, listen, we've seen your work on ecosystems and platforms and we're doing work on future of workforce and would you consider being a guest editor? And I called them, I ended up in a phone call with David Kieran, who's now my co-author and, and um, is the managing editor and said, you know, if this is really about, at the time they were writing about opportunity marketplaces, talent marketplaces, which is a very interesting other discussion, but is very internal to the firm focused. I said, if, if you're doing all internal to the firm, then I'm probably not your right person because I really think about engaging communities, external platforms, ecosystems, et cetera. And he said, no, that's the point. We want to move this discussion from being purely internal to also incorporating external. I said, well, if that's the case, then let's do it. So then last year I started working with them in this program. It's part of what's called the Big Ideas Initiative. So, um, I'll show you. So the Big Ideas Initiative has AI and leadership and future of the workforce. And I now lead future of the workforce as guest editor. And in April, we came out with the research report and you can go right on to, here's the link. You can go on to Sloan. Uh, again, if, I, if someone can't find it, you can let me know. We did an interactive that's pretty fun that probably very few people are gonna ever look at. So I'll tell you, you should take a look at it. If you click on it, you can mess with our data and cut it in all different ways. And SMR decided they wanted to do it. Yeah, I don't know how if anyone's how many people will ever touch it, but it's fun and interesting and may provide some new insights. <clears throat> and also in January, I'll talk a little about we did a research highlight report in SMR that was a kind of preview of the work. So this is a little bit in, in backwards order. So January, the preview report came out and April, the full research report. And what I'd like to do now is kind of give you some of the highlights from that report. So again, the context is <clears throat> the Big Ideas Initiative, which includes these other topic areas, then future of the workforce. So this is a multi-year project. Also, SMR and Deloitte have been working together. I think this is the 12th year. It's a very long standing project. Originally, it was about digital transformation. Two years ago, they switched it to future of the workforce. And then uh, last year I became guest editor and it's working closely with Deloitte, <clears throat> excuse me. We have a team from their research group. We have a team that also includes um, two partners from Deloitte and uh, we have access to their data analysts. It's quite amazing actually. And so as again, 2020 was opportunity marketplaces, 2021 was workforce ecosystems. I should have put a little 2022 question mark here. We're working on 2022 report. It will be more about workforce ecosystems. I can tell you that. And we're digging 
deeply into a number of new themes. And then also, again, we have um, an article from January. We're doing a new article. Kate Kellogg, some of you may be familiar with at MIT, is a, a very well-known, excellent professor. Um, she and I and David just finished a book chapter that will be coming out in the Thinkers 50 volume, I think in September, it's going to be an ebook on ecosystems. And I know some of the others who are contributing, that will be very worthwhile to take a look at that book. Um, they're all short chapters, I think it was 3000 words. And then Kate and I are also exploring a qualitative ethnographic research paper and doing, you know, I'd like to move some of this into also much more academic uh, peer review work. So again, we have this future work is through workforce ecosystems original um, article. And the research questions that we've been exploring are basically given the changing nature of work and workplaces driven by technology, how is the meaning of workforce changing? So this is very interesting. I started I did, I think, 25 interviews for last year's report, including, now we can say because it's in the report, like the CHRO of Walmart, um, C-suite executives from Nike, um, Roche, uh, two U.S. Army generals, um, investors, so a wide range of people. And often it became very clear when I started the interviews, if I said, I'm studying future of workforce, by the way, how do you define workforce, which I thought would just be a very quick question, people would go, oh, we've been talking about this, or oh, this is an interesting question. And so it quickly became clear that kind of what is a workforce is not as simple as you may think, because does it include complementers? Does it include app developers? To what extent does it include contractors and freelancers and gig workers, et cetera? And so that's what we've been thinking about. In what ways are the models influencing strategy? What's the effect of organizational culture? And really, what are the implications for management practices? So we identified four shifts that we included in the first January article. One, more non-employees are doing more work for business. So whereas this was a phenomenon that previously I would have thought, oh, it's like 5% of a business. This is like kind of tip of the iceberg. We're seeing more and more companies where they say, mm, like kind of 35 to 50% of our workforce are contingent workforce. That changes the game when you have that large a population uh, of the workforce being contingent. And there's some organizations you may be familiar with, for example, Threadless, which Kareem Lakani has studied in great detail and others. Um, we studied a, a group called Applause, which is U-Test, which is a very interesting organization where the vast, vast majority of the contributors are external workers. And that changes again the game. Shift two, the nature of work is evolving and I'm gonna talk more about that. Shift three, there's growing recognition, diverse and inclusive workforce can deliver more value. So we've been having, at least in the United States, and I think worldwide, we're having more and more discussions about uh, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. And by nature, these models as business models are much more open than uh, previous models. And we find that they're enabling um, organizations to take advantage of diversity. It has risks associated with it. You can use it to say you're becoming more diverse when you're not really. So there are there's kind of the negative side to this, but overall it's an interesting discussion. And just workforce management is becoming more complex because of all of this. Okay, so let me tell you about this. So that was kind of big picture and mostly what we covered in the January article. I am borrowing slides with permission from my colleagues at Deloitte that we uh, all did together. So you're gonna see that the slides are gonna now take a big leap in quality because there were graphic designers involved. Um, and this is work from our report, which is this April report. See, slides got much better. Um, so this is uh, details about information about our kind of what we included in the research. So there were over 5,000 survey respondents, 138 countries, 29 industries, 
Um, most uh, over a quarter of them had revenue over a billion dollars. Again, I did 27 interviews. What's interesting to me is more than two thirds of our respondents were from outside the United States. So this is not a US centric um, research, which is, um, so I think the survey is not US centric. Of course, the authors are all in the US. So we have a US centric perspective, but we are trying to give it a little bit more of an international um, flair. Um, and that's about it for that. I'm happy to again take questions later on who was in it, but that was the survey. And again, we're going to we're in the process of writing this year's survey, so uh, it will I imagine have similar data. Um, we recognize these drivers of workforce change. So first of all, the nature of work is changing. We're seeing much more project based work. Um, we're seeing more complex work often. Um, and so that's one. We're seeing workers' pre preferences are shifting. By the way, most of these trends were happening before COVID and all the lockdowns. The um, pandemic and the lockdowns we see seem to have accelerated them, but we think most of them will last long before the pandemic, long after, excuse me, the pandemic subsides in intensity. Because um, people say, oh, is this a pandemic related topic? And we say, well, I don't think any topic right now isn't in some way affected, especially if you're talking about organizations. but but no, this is not just because we ended up in the pandemic. Um, but workers' preferences are definitely shifting and giving the opportunity or the requirement to work at home over the last um, year, year and a half um, has changed a lot of people's point of view on work. Technology is, is transforming how we engage and manage the workforce. One of my favorite interviews, we were talking about um, I can't remember which organization it was, but um, it may have been NASA, where they need to give uh, bots ID cards and, and numbers and put them into the employee system because otherwise the bots couldn't have access to some data they needed. So I think this is a very interesting question of kind of how you deal with bots and data and other types of technologies and other system level technologies. Uh, and finally, many workers consider themselves free agents versus loyal employees. There are definitely, at least um, we're seeing is this shift. So more than 87% of um, respondents consider their workforce to encompass more than employees. And only, so only 13% consider it to be only full and part-time. On one hand, this shouldn't be surprising. Still, there's something um, striking about seeing such a large number. And every category of the workforce is expected to grow over the next 18 to 24 months um, with technology for workforce augmentation and developers accessory providers ex expected to grow the most. So I also think that is interesting. You can get into different debates about to what extent these categories are gonna grow, but our survey shows and our data shows that we expect all of them to grow. And finally, again, we defined a workforce ecosystem to be a a structure focused on value creation for an organization that consists of complementarities and interdependencies. The structure encompasses actors from within the organization beyond working to pursue both individual and collective goals. So as academics, you will recognize, I think, the interdependencies and complementarities piece. I will tell you that we had a large debate amongst the team. Consultants wouldn't always like to put in words like that into a, a definition that's going to go, um, you know, is, is going, we're trying to have broadly adopted. But I think it's very important that we, since we call this an ecosystem, that we include interdependencies and complementarities. And so thus, we've included it in the definition, and we've spent a lot of time trying to explain to people what we mean by it. And I'm happy we, you can see down here in this, the, fine print, we've added our own definition, and that kind of keeps coming up. So let me just show you, um, there, are a few, there are a bunch more slides here, but I'll just show you a few of the quotes and let you read them. Um, because of my work uh, with the US Army and West Point, I was, and through a colleague from HBS, I was able to get access to two generals, and it was interesting to get their perspective, um, saying the you know, we have to harness the power that your entire workforce, it's about pulling everyone in. Um, 
we can't have people who are not inside the family being treated differently. They're here. Somebody brought them to the family reunion. And I thought that was just a great way to say, look, we have all these employees and contributors outside um, the main organization and we need to figure it out. And I'd say from a platform perspective, you know, this is very important because we're thinking a lot about complementers and how do we kind of manage and complementers is exactly what this gets at. Here, um, again, the top one quote is about diversity. If you want to have access to the best talent, you have to value and appreciate diversity. And Jen Felch from Dell um, also talked about diversity. So again, you can take a quick read of those or see them in the report. Basically, we said, I think I'm hitting on time here, so we'll just pretty quickly. So this is there's the traditional employee lifecycle approach, then workforce ecosystem, and I'll click through these. There's figure six in the report goes through each of these different elements, and, and I think it's an interesting approach to say, okay, performance management, compensation and rewards, learning and development. How are all of these practices different if you're in a world that's workforce ecosystems? Again, here's a quote. Um, this was an interesting question. Who owns the, these topics? Is it HR? Is it procurement? Is it supply chain? Again, as academics, we often don't get detailed into these kinds of questions, but practitioners are really dealing with them. And so this was, again, a Deloitte slide where the time is now. Uh, reframing from an employee-centric approach to workforce ecosystems can drive significant strategic value. There are a couple of my references that we've built on. And with that, I think I, um, we're at 45. So I think I'll stop there and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Sure. Who wants to go for the first question? Perhaps in the meantime, I, I, I can ask one. So if you... Um, you mentioned these these changes, like the the nature of the workforce is shifting and so on. Which, from your perspective, would you argue is first theoretically most intriguing? So, where do you see like idiosyncratic phenomena that also need new theory? Basically, where where you say, well, we have a problem that 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 you can't explain, describe, or analyze. Uh, these phenomena from the perspective, say, of the, the normal kind of whatever pipeline or whatever non-platform uh, ontology, uh, and which of those phenomena do you think is most interesting? So when we have new scholars, upcoming scholars, where would you focus your, your, your emphasis on? Uh, so it's a really good question. So I just popped up the slide that kind of summarizes at least four of the changes. So we have them here, and we can just walk through them for a few minutes if you'd like. Yeah, please, please. please. Um, so in terms of nature of work is changing, uh, and I need to look at kind of the paper again, but I think this is an interesting one where people keep saying it, and I'd like to clarify it, and I'd love to do a little more work on what do we mean by the nature of work is changing. I will give, by the way, I will give a plug to one of my co-authors, Jeff Schwartz, recently published a book called Work Disrupted, which is, again, a very practitioner book but he talks a lot about some of these changes. So it would be worth taking a look at that book as well. Um, so I think we have a sense that work is becoming um, disaggregated and more project-based and more technology bounded. And yet while people say that, I also think you can even hear as I'm saying it, there's this conflict between it's becoming more um, time-bound, project-based, yet more complex and interconnected. That seems a little hard to resolve to me. Mm -hmm. so, I'm not, so I would like to understand more about uh, what do we mean when we say that? And from a, you know, from a theory standpoint, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how we make that leap, but I feel like we need to understand better what is happening in the nature of work. And on one hand, it may be industry specific. On the other hand, I do think going to the third with technology enablement, um, we are seeing some trends that because of the use of AI and machine learning, things like that, that, uh, that may span industries. 
So I guess that to me would be worth exploring more. And so that leads to this technology is transforming how we engage and manage the workforce is another area where, so I think the pandemic showed that, you know, the question of monitoring employees and how one monitors employees, whether one should be monitoring employees, all of those types of technologies, how does training work? I mean, so from a from a real workforce management standpoint, I think you can get into these discussions. From a um, from a platform standpoint, you know, we talk a lot about the algorithms. We talk about biases in the algorithms. Um, all of those conversations that we've had about platforms, data, bias, etc., I think are understudied and worth understanding more and affect these. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some, I, I don't know if that gets at what you were asking, but I yeah, certainly- no, it's, it, it's, that's, uh, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Dania, you had a question. Yeah, so thank you very much for the interesting talk. Um, I have a quite a big or yeah, general question. So you, you mentioned the locus of activity and there the defining role of the organizational boundaries. And so I wanted a little bit, okay, we have talked about platforms, talked about ecosystems. So what's missing here is the digital part. So what, and obviously the, the role of digitalization has a big impact on this blurring of boundaries, right? And I wondered, where do you see the, the most important driver or impact or questions that arise with regard when we shift from the offline to the online to the digital world with regard how we can define these boundaries and where they dissolve and yeah, you know, that's in this regard, uh, where are the main points here? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and again, I like to go to very, um, specific examples, right? So I'll give you an example of the company Applause that I don't, um, or you test. I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with them, but we use them in the paper and I spoke to their CEO and founder. So Applause is a um, software testing company, basically, right? Um, I say software hesitantly because it's not only software, but so it's a user experience and software testing company. And they have something like 700,000 testers, or at least they did when we spoke to them, none of whom are their employees. And of their employees, which they have like a thousand, I think at the time it was somewhere on there, um, if I remember correctly, none of them are real testers, right? Or you know, maybe a handful. So they have their functionality is in the community. And so I've signed up to be a tester you can all sign up because it was interesting to see kind of how they interact with this community. And, you know, they're able to have this community because, um, because of digitalization, right? Because of these systems, right? 20 years ago, you probably couldn't have built, or you certainly couldn't have as easily built this type of a community. So, <clears throat> You know, that's a company that is built, is not going through a transformation, right? It was founded, it was born as a, a company that the locus of activity is firmly outside the organization while locus of control is inside. And so when we talk about organizational boundaries there, if we were only talking about the people in the company, so for example, if you did an employee engagement survey, right, and you only um, asked the people who actually were in the US, we'd say W2 employees or full-time or part-time actually hired employees, then you'd be missing 700,000 people who are participating in creating value for this organization, right? So to me, that's a very stark um, view of kind of where are the organizational boundaries? Am I part of the organization? Now, another example, even within that community. So I signed up, I've never done anything for them. Am I part of the community? There are people who signed up who spend 100 hours a week working for them. Are they and I the same level in the organization? Probably no, right? And so 
but we can take the same type of training we get, but we get different compensation. But so I think there also is a very interesting question where we talk about kind of the community or the external community, but then who in the community? And we did one interview where we were talking to people where they said, for example, Amazon, I think Mechanical Turk, there are groups in India who have gotten together and I haven't researched them, but others have who get together and work round the clock to get work done, right? And so they present themselves as one entity, I don't know if an individual, but yet there are multiple people behind it. But then their rankings go up and their ratings go up and they get better work and better jobs because they're much more efficient than one human would be, right? So, um, so someone asked, what's the name of the software testing? So if you look under applause, A-P-P-L-A-U-S-E, you should find it, but the community is called U-Test, mm -hmm. the letter U-T-E-S-T. -E but if you go to applause.com, that's the, that's the name of the firm, um, I believe, is, is the parent firm. Um, so again, I think with, um, <clears throat> you know, who, where are the organizational boundaries? And so that's not specifically about digitalization or you know this system or that system, but it's enabled by all these technologies. Tano Daniel, does that start to get at the question or were you going somewhere different? No, no, yeah, I think so. So I think there, of course, a lot of specific impacts of digitization, but I think this is, yeah, a very big one, yeah. Yeah, Thank and you. then Thank I you. guess the yeah. other, the other last piece on that I would say is that I didn't, mention is I think the data questions around all this, which then get generated and data both that is input and that is observed, right? So we have an interesting example where there's a company I was working with and by nature of how often people logged into their bank accounts, they could tell, um, they could tell whether they were gonna be a good credit risk and whether you should loan money to them, right? Not by what was in their bank account, but by their behavior and how they interacted with the bank. And that whole world is a whole other set of, um, I think, interesting questions. So does does checking your bank account make you rich? That would be... <laughs> yeah, no, so it depends. There's It's actually a U-curve, right? So if you check it every day, um, if you're a company, this was for firms, right? And it's for small firms. So if a small firm checks every day, they're basically not a good risk. They care, they are spending too much time and too worried about it. And if they only check it every three months, they're also a bad risk because right. they are not paying enough attention to it. So there is a sweet spot that they figured out whatever, I don't remember what the day was, but they could figure out like how often is the right time for a small company to be doing certain things with their bank account that would then lead them to be a good credit risk. Yeah. Um, thank you so much.